All right. Good afternoon. Good to see you all here. I have the privilege of getting to welcome you to the 40th annual Scandret Lecture on the Integration of Faith and, and Psychology. Uh, I'm Sarah Hall. I'm the Dean of Psychology Counseling and Family Therapy. I know some of you I've had in class, but many of you I uh, do not know, but I'm glad to have all of you here today. I am going to ask everybody to move up a little bit so that we can fill in uh, a little bit closer to the front and leave space for people who may still be coming in. So if you want, would stand up and move up at least a couple of rows, if you want to be really bold and move even closer to the front, you can do that. Now you have a sense of uh, where the speaker will be standing and choose your seat accordingly. I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of our time together this afternoon while people are getting resettled. Uh, once, once people are sitting again, I will open us in prayer. Uh, and then Dr. Ray Finney will come up and tell us a little bit about Onis Scandret, after whom the Scandret Lecture is named. Uh, and then we'll hear from Dr. Terry Watson, who will be introducing our speaker, uh, Dr. Pam King. Uh, after, at the end of Dr. King's talk, well, there'll be some time for questions and answers. There are microphones in both aisles, so if you have a question you would like to ask, you can come up and line up behind uh, one of those microphones. And then following the lecture, there will be a reception right out in the lobby uh, of the BGH. Let me pray for us today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be together. We thank you that you have given us uh, minds and souls and bodies and spirits uh, to be integrated and to draw knowledge and information from a variety of sources that you've given us. Uh, Lord, and we thank you for this place where we seek to integrate our faith with a variety of subjects, including psychology. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Dr. King and her work. Uh, we pray that you would bless this time that we have together, uh, that you would give Dr. King inspiration as she speaks to us and help us to have receptive hearts and minds to how you would have us think about and receive what we hear today. We pray most of all, Lord, that you would be glorified in this time. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to our Scandret Lecture. It's named in honor of Onis Scandret, who was the first chair of the psychology department. He came, he started his career actually teaching in a one-room schoolhouse in South Dakota. At some time in his life, he has taught everything from kindergarten through graduate school. Um, and he came here in 1957 in the philosophy department. He helped start the psychology department in 1962. Um, I was telling somebody else about this, and they said, so you're saying he didn't, he didn't get along with Art Holmes, who was the guy running, the famous guy running our philosophy department at the time. I think they actually got along, but um, Onus was saying, look, there's this, this move that's been around for like 100 years that we would like to maybe study and, and talk about. Um, and sometimes in a Christian place, psychology was looked at a bit suspiciously, a usurpation of pastoral care at its at best and at worst, bringing man's dis, man's wisdom to the realm of God. And and Ona said, you know what? We need a we need a scientific approach to this, and we need to study it. There's no area we shouldn't be studying. And so it's in that spirit that uh, at the end of his life, he endowed this lecture uh, as well to to remind us of ways to connect Christian faith with psychology. And with that, I will yield to Dr. Watson, who is going to introduce you more particularly to Dr. King. Good afternoon. It's my very great pleasure to introduce our Scandret lecturer, the Reverend Dr. Pamela Epstein King. 
Dr. King holds the Peter L. Benson Chair of Applied Developmental Science in the School of Psychology at Fuller Theological Seminary. Dr. King also serves as Executive Director of the Thrive Center for Human Development, where she leads scholarly initiatives to build an empirical field of study of religious and spiritual development within developmental psychology that provides a psychological, scientific perspective on spiritual formation. Dr. King is a prolific international researcher and scholar whose published work involves a number of books and articles, including The Reciprocating Self, a text that's used in a number of our classes here at Wheaton. Her groundbreaking research has been funded by Compassion International, the John Templeton Foundation, and the Fetzer Institute. In addition to her scholarly work, Dr. King is ordained in the Presbyterian Church and regularly speaks, preaches, and consults for various community organizations and churches. I learned this morning that Dr. King is um, a local Chicagoan who actually grew up in a small town near Evanston and I believe attended camp at Wheaton College at some point um, in her upbringing. Yes, pom-poms, yes. Uh, and we are so delighted to be able to welcome Dr. King back to the Midwest and look forward this afternoon to her scandrette entitled Living Out Love, Spirituality, Virtues, and Thriving. Please join me in welcoming Dr. King. Hello, and what an honor um, to be with you here today. I um, am coming from Pasadena, Fuller Theological Seminary, where I'm on the faculty of the School of Psychology, if that just got a little muddled in all those long, fancy titles. I felt very intimidated by that reading. Thank you, Dr. Watson. But I am thrilled to be here today, as I hope um, to share with you throughout the presentation um, how deeply rooted in my life from a very early time were questions that I came to learn were about psychology um, and that were always related to my faith. Um, and I just decided to make, I guess, a career out of my curiosity. Um, and here I am today still asking more questions and very excited to share with you a bit about where my journey has led me. Um, I would really like to say thank you um, to Dr. Sarah Hall for the invitation, to Marilyn who has coordinated and is just an administrative ninja and amazing. Um, and thank you for the very warm reception from everyone. It's been um, really lovely and um, very hospitable, so thank you so much. Um, a little bit of business, um, I want to say, is that I am, um, at this point in my life, on the faculty, as I mentioned, and I'm also the executive director of an organization at Fuller called the Thrive Center for Human Development. It actually once was formally and pretty much exclusively a research center in the School of Psychology, and in the last couple years, in the quarantine, shadows of COVID, we transition to be more of an out facing center where we are translating the psychological research that has been done by various Thrive Center faculty members, other School of Psychology and Marriage and Family members, and others widely, um, to be hopefully of use to the church and for Christian uh, spiritual practices, et cetera. So I'm very, um, I have been encouraged to encourage you to actually pull out your phones. Usually people like don't pull out your phones. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about Thrive or signing up for a monthly newsletter, you can do that through the CR code. Um, and before I formally begin, I always really appreciate being able to connect with people. And in, this is, uh, although I write about the reciprocating self until the end, I get to tell you more about me than I get to hear about you. But we'll get there. I wanted to share a little bit about um, who I am, where I've come from, and particularly why this is so meaningful for me to be here today. Um, I grew up in the village of Golf. This is my eighth grade graduation picture. Hail the 80s. Um, my two siblings, younger brothers, I think that was the last time, even with big hair, I was as tall as my, I'm the oldest of those three. Um, I then went to Glenbrook South High School. I love this photo because it actually foreshadows the serious professor that I have become. Um, I was in the midst of organizing a canned food drive against Glenbrook North in Northbrook. I attended Glenbrook South and we did win. 
Thank you. Um, but I, was, I must have been a pill as a high school student. Now look how serious I am. Um, I grew up attending, um, a very important part of my life was the First Presbyterian Church in Evanston, Illinois, um, where I was deeply formed by their youth group there. I didn't know uh, actually many people of faith in my high school. It was a pretty secular experience for me, but my church was a really um, enriching, informative community and experience for, that, for me. Um, my faith was very important. And I chose, uh, when I went to college, to go to California. I thought, this will really test my faith. The land of fruits and nuts out there. Um, I went to Stanford and actually found out that there were more people there that had more vital faith than I knew, actually, back in Glenview and golf. Um, I eventually went to Fuller. I did a Master's of Divinity, a PhD in Psychology, pursued ordination, and actually was ordained in the chapel at Stanford. And that's another story that I will not share right now, but that is Stanford's Memorial Church. Um, and then, uh, these are my kids. I am a mom of three teenagers, which is extraordinary in many ways, and our dog. Um, Maddie. And then this is part of my lab at the Thrive Center at Fuller, some of our Thrive Fellows. So just a bit about me. And one thing I love, the, house, the picture, that's our house of bricks. We don't have bricks in California because of earthquakes. And it's wonderful to be back on your beautiful campus with bricks because I don't get to see that much. So that's really fun. So partly I wanted to share and start um, with where I come from, both not just geographically, you know, over the freeway a bit through traffic, but also in history. And I think this moment in the early 2020s is a very particular time. When I grew up, there were a lot of things that were quite certain. There were ways you did things, ways you showed up, uh, structures, organizations that you were a part of. And we are in a time that is obviously in flux, in deep, deep change. Um, you know, the pandemic, um, we're looking at stats, I'll show you a few in a minute, about religious participation. Um, we have this increasing polarization within the United States. We have climate change issues. We have wars erupting on our planet and school shootings um, that are just, I'm very aware of a mom of teens of how real that is, um, of even just trying to get a tutor to visit my daughter's high school is hard because of security. Um, but we are living in a very different time. And, for this reason, um, I really am looking at the younger people in this audience today, and no offense to the, your esteemed faculty here at Wheaton, but you are in an extraordinary moment. Um, and those of you particularly who are interested in psychology, which I assume because you're here, and of faith, that you are being equipped to have insight into human needs, human nature, how humans function, and also the wisdom and guidance of an amazing faith tradition not to mention the Holy Spirit and God with you in that, and are going to be extremely well poised to do some very innovative, innovative and extraordinary work as people trained in psychology. Um, we are uncovering the radical increases in anxiety and depression, and there is just a lot of need out there for people with the backgrounds that you are in the process of gaining. So I've got my eyes on you today and really hope to motivate you to think about some creative ways that you will um, be participating in God's ongoing work of redemption and flourishing in this world. Um, and so I'm particularly privileged to be here for that. Um, so just the doom and gloom first. Um, Pew Research has been tracking like American religious habits um, and has showed that a lot of people are disengaging from conventional and traditional um, religious attendance and re religious forms. Um, the stats that I have here, interestingly enough, these are looking at millennials um, that only 49% are saying millennials are affiliated with religious organizations or churches or denominations or congregations and 49% non. This is 2019 data. I was actually, as discouraging as this is, was very encouraged two weeks, three weeks ago, they put out new data showing that things have not radically shifted during the pandemic, which I was shocked. I feel like a lot of my peers, a lot of people I know, haven't quite found their way back to church as consistently as they were pre-pandemic. Um, but and these are cumbersome to get through right now, but a big take home would be the red lines on top showing that the younger generations are definitely less affiliated than the older generations, which is not 
um, surprising. Uh, but what Pew reported is 3% more people are going to church or religious congregations less than they were before the pandemic. And those stats get a little complicated to interpret, but the take home is there's not huge, huge shifts, at least in at least monthly attendance is what they were looking at. But um, one of the things, and you can ignore those numbers, they get complicated, um, is that not only are we seeing a decline in congregational attendance, but there's also, in younger generations, a decline in conventional institutions like scouting, YMCA, other civic and public groups that used to serve a function that Peter Berger called um, being medi oops, you know what, I have that, uh, here we go, as mediating structures. And I love this concept of mediating structures, and I want to offer this to you today if you're not familiar with it. Berger, who's a sociologist, talked about how congregations were institutions that young people became a part of. And in the process of being engaged in like a religious congregation, they had access to mentors. There was often a creed or a code or a narrative. Um, they had rituals and practices. And as they came out of these organiz organizations, they came out more formed as adults. So this is very easy to imagine in scouting. In fact, in many ways, universities play this role today. But part of the, our social fabric, of the United States at least, these traditional and conventional institutions are not attracting as many young people anymore. So a viable question becomes, what is forming people today if it's not these institutions? Um, and I would say that although there's a lot of social change, people are actually staying quite the same. Uh, my colleague Justin Barrett and I uh, wrote quite extensively from an evolutionary psychological perspective about how as humans, our brains and nervous systems have not evolved technically. We really have, our hardware in a sense, has not changed much. We still have the basic human needs of connection. We still need to eat, you know, despite the fact that we have Instagram and GP chat. We still need people, we need air. But the organizations around us are radically shifting. We have an emerging new landscape on our hands of what is going on socially and what is shaping and forming people. And despite, so when I consider that, I feel like we are moving from structures like organizations to more systems. So people are more apt to spend more time on social media platforms than they are to be a part of a club like Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. And what I want to do with you today is think about what are the opportunities that are before us. One of my earliest mentors is the late John Gardner, um, and he said, what we have before us are breathtaking opportunities described as insoluble problems. And I'm officially old enough to be like, say, oh, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, forgive me. But John's voice persists in my head and says, challenges me to think, invites me to think, how do we look around us? Increasing rates of depression, increasing rates of anxiety. How do we look around us and say, what are the opportunities before us? And I actually think religion and spirituality, not surprisingly, have a lot of answers. So today, I want to share with you um, a little bit of a grand tour of my last 20 years of work. And I'm going to keep my eye on the clock. Um, this, preparing for this lecture made me realize I have been on the planet for a few minutes and have thought and written and studied um, uh, quite a, a few things that I'm attempting to put together today. Um, when I speak about thriving, um, people always want to know, what is thriving? How do you thrive? And people want a formula. They want to know, like, if a kid's going to thrive, like, do they need a laptop? How many mentors? How many volunteer hours? Um, do they need conflict res resolution training? What do they need? And the reality of our very diverse and chaotic world is there's no set formula of what people need. And that we need to think in broader, um, in cyclical ideas. And so when it comes right down to it, I want to say that thriving has to do with leaning into love and living out love. And as people of faith, 
we probably didn't need interpersonal neurobiology or attachment theory to tell us that we're relational, that we need love, that we need not just our mothers and our fathers or caregivers, we need God as our heavenly father. We need an other bigger than us. We need the intimacy that Christ offers us. We need the proximity of the Holy Spirit. So we, there's a lot of psychology that tells us like, love is good, like more is more when it comes to love, like go crazy, get a lot of love. And I mean like the good kind of love. Um, but how you live out love is another question. And that is a lot of the work of thriving. And so that's what I wanna to talk to you a bit about today. And so just to hit some large notes of where I want to go, um, I know some of you have read a book that um, I co-authored with um, Jack Balswick and Kevin Reimer called The Reciprocating Self. I want to talk about our telos, our purpose. We'll get more into that and where thriving leads us. More recently, I've been working on something I'm calling the Virtue Systems Framework, just because it sounds good. Um, someday, maybe it'll be a Virtue Systems Theory, but for now, we'll just go with Framework with a little F. Um, and if you were in the Scandret lecture last year, you will um, some of this will be familiar. It's work that I started with uh, dear colleague Sarah Schnichter. And then I want to look at an ecological perspective of promoting thriving. I'm hoping some of you are going, hmm, how can I help other thrives? How might I thrive? I want to talk about that. And then lastly, I want to offer a challenge, and I hope you hold this in the back of your mind, is how do you live out love? How do you live out God's love in this world? But hopefully I'll give you some tools to think about that. So as a youngster at the Presbyterian Youth Group, we called ourselves the Pigs, P-Y-G, Presbyterian Youth Group. Um, John 10, 10 was one of the first verses I memorized. And at a young age, I honestly was really captivated about this idea of fullness. And I think even as a young person, um, I didn't go for abundance like prosperous, but I knew there was something deep, something meaningful, something lasting, and something profound about this experience of knowing Christ as my savior, as someone who loved me, died for me, was with me, and wanted my well-being. And so I really turned to a lot of study to think about what on the earth does it mean to have fullness of life in Christ. So one of the places I ended up when I was working on my Master's of Divinity, I got very captivated by the idea of telos. Telos is the Greek word for purpose or goal, or also like imagine view from completion. So, and as I got more into psychology and got tasked with teaching human development, all of a sudden I'm like, hmm, that telos idea is really helpful. Fuller is on quarters, and so when I was asked to teach lifespan development, um, that's womb to the tomb, cradle to the grave, uh, diverse persons, um, moral development, spiritual development, identity development in 10 weeks. That's the rub of the quarter system. You have 10 weeks. I was like, well, how on earth do you figure out what to teach? There are so many different perspectives in developmental psychology. And so with my colleagues, Jack and Kevin at the time, I said, well, what about thinking about telos? Like, what is God's purpose for human development? Why did God create us? And within the evangelical tradition, no doubt, we think a lot about and thank God, which we should a lot about what Jesus saved us from. But there's less published, <laughs> there's less talk, and there's less energy given to what Jesus saved us for. And more recently, theologies of vocation and calling um, have become a bit more mainstream, studies of joy I've been involved with. But these sides of the equation have not been as broadly um, and deeply um, looked at. And definitely have been, but not as deep as things like sin and being saved from death, which is fantastic. I'm all in for that. Um, so with this concept of telos, I turn to um, theological uh, anthropology, trying to understand theological perspectives of what it means to be a human. Um, and in my graduate school work, had come up with this idea of a reciprocating self, which I want to share with you. That now, um, this book is in its second printing, and I, I, I know a couple of you read it because I spoke with you earlier. How many of you are familiar with this book? I see some hands. Okay, great. I want to let you know, Ray, 
my next door neighbor, Ray, is the artist who painted these paintings. Um, and my husband is actually the gentleman in light blue behind the F. It looks like the F is his mustache. He doesn't have a mustache. Um, the woman in the top right corner is actually a home girl from Father Greg Boyle's ministry. But my neighbor, Ray, is quite an accomplished artist. And this is a line of paintings. He, he's done over a 1,000. He calls population. And as a person of faith, he is captivated by the uniqueness and dignity of all persons. And I love how he paints people. They're not terribly realistic always, but they capture so much of the spirit of people. And these are actually painted on glass, should you ever get to see them, they're very beautiful. So the reciprocating self became this idea of telos. And in short, the idea is that God, the Godhead, is three persons, three unique persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who all have unique roles and functions within the Trinity, but yet they are united as one, as one God. And as humans made in the image of God, I, as a psychologist or budding wannabe psychologist, latched onto this idea that as humans, perhaps part of what it means to be made in the image of God is to mirror that both individual uniqueness, but yet call to be in relationship and intimacy with others. Now, Right now, those kind of ideas are very common. When I came of age theologically in the 90s, um, this idea of like a social understanding of the Trinity um, or a Trinitarian anthropology were rather novel. And actually, when I took my theology exam at Fuller to be on the faculty in 2000, I was suggested very quietly not to bring that up. But Dr. Mao, the president, at the very end said, might Bart have anything to contribute um, to the ways we think about anthropology? So he kind of set me up to share some of my emerging thoughts that now are very commonplace in Christian circles. But one of the ways that I have unpacked um, understanding of this Imago Dei is not just Trinitarian anthropology, but also a Christological and understanding how this invitation or command to be made um, in the image of God and to that the Christ is the perfect image of God. How are we supposed to become like Christ? So when I start with thinking about telos and how we might understand like what is our personal telos, our collective telos as a, or teloi as a species, um, this is a model that I use to think about it. So we are all invited, exhorted to become like Christ. Um, and so as Christians, we attempt to model our lives after the character and action um, of Jesus' life. But we realize that although we're called to become conformed to the image of God in Christ, that that does not mean conformity. I'm so sorry, it does not mean uniformity. So we can become like Christ, conformed to the image of Christ, but we don't do that in a unified way. Steele, Jordan, you are called to be like Jesus, but not like one another. We are all called to become like Christ as ourselves. Like, please don't all go talking about telos and the reciprocating self, because then more people will put more people to sleep. But you are called to live out Christ's love in this world as your unique self. Now, I hear it so often in social media around, like, well, you be you. You do you. This is not you do you. This is, in a sense, you do you, but it's you do you for the sake of the world. You be yourselves so you can participate in God's ongoing work in the world and contribute to the world beyond your own life. And so relationality becomes the third pedal, so to speak, in this model of that we are called to be in relationship with those that we're close to, we're called to be known, we're called to be loved, we're called to be accountable, but we're also called to give beyond ourselves and our in-group, which increasingly is becoming um, a helpful admonition for society. So, I would say telos, or purpose, is found at the intersection of these three aspects of life. So to become a reciprocating self is the journey of growing in alignment and at the intersection of becoming more like Christ as yourself 
in deepening relationships with others. So human purpose similarly is found at this intersection. Um, a mentor of mine, Bill Damon, uh, who has done a lot of pioneering work as a psychologist on purpose, talks about purpose from a psychological perspective as being an attainable goal. So it's actually something you pursue. It's not just a lofty idea of like what gives you meaning, but it's an actionable goal that is meaningful to yourself, but that makes a contribution beyond you. And the research on people, kids, uh, business leaders, uh, teachers, students, people who pursue purpose in this way have extraordinary outcomes. Um, much to Bill and his wife's chagrin, who have really worked in this area, they were really attempting to get, especially kids and their parents, off of performance orientation, not to be so grade-centered, um, and how many activities you have, and to have this more purposeful, with this noble moral orientation towards life. But the reality is the research is so astounding on how well kids do in school when they have purpose and how they get into college, that now performance-oriented parents are like, okay, you got to find a purpose. Um, so it's, he's very frustrated that it's been somewhat co-opted by our performance-oriented culture. So I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. In many ways to me, it feels like a huge invitation. It's not like, oh, something nice that Jesus offers. But in a way, it's an admonition. As Christ's ambassadors on earth, he needs us to live our lives to the fullest for God's glory and for the benefit of his kingdom. And so I challenge you to think of that as an admonition or invitation. And I would say in research, empirical research pans out that fullness is inseparable from God, others, and creation. And so we need to think about a type of human thriving that enables the world and other societies to flourish. So if my thriving, my doing well, is at the expense of others, theoretically, it's not too thriving. And I think this moment, being um, Earth Day this week, it's a great moment to pause and say, yeah, we kind of need our physical environment, our world to flourish for us to even think about thriving. And I think this moment that we're in is making us much more mindful about global pandemics, issues that are global, and that realizing that the way we live does impact um, other people and, and our environment. So within this book is not only just a theological anthropology of, of um, the reciprocating self, but is also um, a psychological approach and goes through the lifespan about how each stage of the life people come more fully into reciprocating selves. And I want to just think with you quickly about that as people grow in attention, these are psychological capacities that they need. So as I've been around people today, some people have asked, like, well, what do people need to thrive? These are all things people need to thrive. They need attention, self-awareness, emotion regulation, ability to pursue goals, um, they need identity, they need strengths. This is a very strength-based approach of like, what are your passions? What are you good at? Don't be an electrical engineer if you hate math. From a relational perspective, we have a lot of psychology that informs how we think about how people can be in deeper and better relationships, whether attachment theory I've mentioned, cultivating empathy, having the ability to take perspectives, Engaging with people in different contexts and cultures from yourself um, helps with perspectives. We need to be vulnerable. We need to be able to engage with diverse people, conflict resolution, et cetera, contributing to the greater good, as I said. And then lastly, an area that I would say is less studied within psychology is when I'm in psychological circles, I talk about individual, relational, and aspirational development. When I'm at a research conference, becoming like Christ doesn't always land well. People get a little lost if they're not in a Christian setting. But our aspirational development has to do with how we make meaning, um, what becomes of value to us, what our morals are, our moral identity, our moral beliefs, our moral emotions, the development of virtue. And it also has to do with our spiritual development, how we know and encounter God, 
how we internalize beliefs, internalize those experiences, how we have transcendence, and our devotion and commitment to that. But these are all necessary to become more reciprocating persons. And this moral and spiritual domain is extremely important because if we just think about self and other, we need that moral compass to keep us on the track, to keep the other um, in our view as well as ourselves because as humans, we can get kind of selfish. So here we are, the full model of the telos towards which development aims. So thriving can be living out love. It can also be growth towards telos or transformation towards telos. So thriving is living on purpose, pursuing purpose, becoming more like Christ as yourself in deepening relationships. Thriving is not self-help. It's no offense, not just about you. It's not just the pursuit of happiness. Subjective positive emotions are great, right, Sarah? But there are times when we don't feel them and what holds us, what enables us to thrive in the midst of challenge and obstacles. So it's not toxic positivity. A thriving mindset we all know to become differentiated persons and to become like Christ takes a lot of suffering. Life has ups and downs, and we all have weaknesses and vulnerabilities. So just five take-homes on thriving. Is thriving is adaptive growth? I'm a developmentalist, so we are, you never reach the bar where you're done thriving. It's like a direction, it's the journey, not the destination, and it's being adaptive. How many of us learned to adapt in the last three years, right? I mean, like every day, do I wipe off the groceries? Do I not? Like, how do I get food? Can I get toilet paper? How do I advise my students? How do I teach? We are constantly adapting. Um, but we are growing towards purpose, that strength base that recognizes the individual, that is relational, that has that aspirational, that value-based spiritual component. It's nonlinear. Life has ups and downs. As I said, joys and suffering. And thank you, Brene Brown, for helping us realize that vulnerabilities are OK, and that actually vulnerabilities are great portals to transformation. So a thriving mindset has this mindset of growth, of being open to our weaknesses and vulnerabilities, to seeking help, to being relational. It's not self-reliance. I also like to emphasize that thriving uh, takes in something we call, in developmental psychology, specificity. All persons can thrive and contribute. I just wrote a paper with a theologian on um, neurodiversity and thriving. And how do we understand a model of thriving where all persons can thrive, even people who are not neurotypical? What kind of environments do they need to be in so that they can pursue experience themselves, so that they can relate. For people who, before neurotypical reasons or trauma, are relationally challenged, and we know relationally, relationships are key to thriving, how do we help compensate for that? How do we surround them with extra community? And all persons can contribute, no matter how small, no matter how young. Any of you been around a baby, they may not be doing it intentionally but they light up our faces when they smile. So looking for ways to contribute. A, a great discussion we had at lunch was how, as a clinician, do you think about this telos of a reciprocating self? Often in therapy, people come in with an issue, and kind of the goal is to help heal them, help them come back to normalcy, but there's not necessarily this next step of how do you pursue purpose, how do you give back, how are you actively reciprocating and contributing to your environment? Um, so I leave that with a question for you to think about how this might be relevant to clinical settings. And lastly, and I'll speak a bit more about this shortly, is that thriving is really rooted in love, in meaning making, making meaning out of love, and, and the pursuit of purpose. So, I've kind of foreshadowed where I hope the ship of thriving is going. Um, and so I just want to quietly ask you in your own life, how do you feel like you in this stage 
are called to live out love in, in the seat you're in now, in the class, the program, the year, the assistant professorship, associate professorship, station in life. How are you called to live out love? And many of you are preparing for a ministry or for a vocation. And how do you feel like you are being, don't you love that, called to live out love? So now I want to share a bit about some of the research um, that in, brings in the concept of virtue. So we want to move from love to purpose. And wouldn't it be great if we could just like eat chocolate and feel loved and like pursue our purpose? It's, it's not quite that simple. Um, and I wish in my own life that I could figure out purpose based on just experiencing love. We need to be a little more proactive. Um, Sarah Schnichter, a dear colleague who was at Fuller at the Thrive Center and now at Baylor and who spoke at the Scandret lecture last year, um, I know spoke a bit on virtue and, and I want to elaborate on some of the work that we started together. So we think about virtue um, as these psychological constructs that actually enable us to live out love. So if we can just think practically for a second, sometimes you need patience. That's kind of Sarah's virtue of expertise. You need hope. You need faith to live out love. So I want to think with you a bit about how virtue is and the importance of how religion and spirituality promotes this. So from a big perspective of where I started in these shifts that we're having, theoretically, if people are living out love and being virtuous and pursuing purposes, the goods that are given back to society should contribute to a virtuous and flourishing society where there's more trust, more positive social interaction, and more shared values. We know from social capital research, those are three qualities that make societies and organizations go round. So if we're not cultivating virtues and we're being vicious, the goods that we as humans generate to society enable society, promote a languishing society, where instead of trust, we get distrust. Instead of interaction, we get division. Instead of having shared values, there's more vices. So it becomes a cyclical circle. And this is where the study of human development, to me, is marvelous and wonderful. Because we need to think about, how are we creating good humans that can create to a society that is adapting and changing? And how, particularly, I'm interested in, does our faith enable us to do that? So religion is, I think, an extraordinary resource. And as far as the things that I have studied out there, religion has so many resources for promoting virtue. And today I want to excavate with you a bit about the religious ecology of resources available within religion that can enable this virtuous flow trajectory to go forth, or can hinder it, as is often the case. So religion is a great context for moral and virtue development. Um, I just recently wrote a chapter um, where I introduced this idea of a virtue systems framework that thinks a lot about what goes on in the individual system of the person. And this, whereas psychologists, is so exciting because you have lenses to understand the psychological capacities that go into being virtuous. If you don't have a lot of emotion regulation and get angry, angry easy, it's, it's hard to be virtuous. So there's really practical psychological aspects about um, being virtuous. And then virtues also are contingent on a context. So we all know what's virtuous here at Wheaton actually may not be virtuous at the University of Chicago, which is not far away. What's virtuous at the University of Chicago may not be virtuous here. And so as human beings, we need to be able to read situations to understand what is the moral context around us, the moral invitation, so to speak. And we need to eventually cultivate an automatic response to know how to have a virtuous response. So my brother is an AI, um, and I don't know if you know of the HoloLens that Microsoft developed, but he was, he's really smart. Um, he, there's two systems in the HoloLens, and that's their um, virtual reality product that you put on and see. And so one of the systems is the system that reads reality, and the other system is the system, I'm sorry, one reads reality, what is, green chairs, people. 
The other projects the augmented or virtual reality. And it's really important to have both because if I've got goggles on and I'm like thinking I'm in like Rome, which sounds fantastic, and I don't know that there are chairs in front of me, I'm gonna walk into them. So we need both systems. Virtue is similar. We need the ability to read the surrounding, to know what is, the mor what is moral, what is the moral opportunity, <laughs> um, and to be able to elaborate and understand with our own meaning systems what's a moral behavioral response. I'm not gonna talk about it much today, but we also need to consider time because we need to consider what's moral short-term and long-term. And as parents, we know this, right? What seems good in the moment is not necessarily good for the long-term. So when we're talking about virtue, we need to develop psychological capacities that enable us to read these situations, make meaning out of them, and figure out what to do. So virtue, which people often use the words character, character strengths, character virtue, it's kind of confusing, but I'm gonna talk about virtue today and I'll tell you my distinction on virtue. Um, I refer to virtues as patterns of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that allow us to morally regulate. So they're very dynamic. So we have cognitive appraisals, thoughts. Someone is hurt, I should do something. We have feelings, feelings might be like anxiety or fear, concern for that person, that activates me. And behaviors, then I do something about it. Now, I'm gonna do this quick because Sarah did speak on a bit this last year, and some of you were here. Um, within virtue, we think of two kind of core components. There is what we call the characteristic adaptations that comes from um, McAdams' work at Northwestern. These are your psychological capacities. This is your emotions, your emotion regulation, the psychological skills of empathy, perspective taking, awareness, focus, all that. Um, and then we need that kind of psycho those muscles, those psychological muscles to do virtue. But then we have this narrative identity that gives us the meaning. And narrative identity, according to uh, in McAdams' work, is an evolving story that we tell about ourselves that informs concepts like identity and self-concept. These include our beliefs, our values, our morals, and it also includes hints of teleology, like our telos and what our purpose is. But it provides meaning and it provides a compass for us. And so Sarah and I talk about virtue having not any narrative identity, like go Bears, that's a narrative. I, I, I went to high school when the Bears won the Super Bowl, that was a big deal. Um, but that's not really a transcendent narrative identity. And we all have many narratives that we weave into our own lives. Guessing that you're in Wheaton, I'm anticipating that the gospel is a master narrative in your life. That God's work of creation, Christ's work of redemption, the Spirit's work of flourishing and healing, that that narrative is perhaps a story that you see your life a part of. You also represent different cultures, different regions in the world, different idiosyncratic pasts where there might be trauma, there might be great opportunities that you had. And so how do you weave all these elements of your story into one narrative? And the transcendent part is a beyond yourself orientation that directs your virtuous moral life. So narrative becomes this hybrid personality unit that involves this identity that's deeply integrated into who we are and these psychological skills that we can practice and cultivate. I want to share with you some research um, from a project that I've been involved with the last number of years. We call it the Compassion International um, Study of Positive Youth Development. And many of you are familiar with Compassion International, the global um, child sponsorship organization. I've been working with the collaborators, collaborators listed there at Tufts in Boston, Compassion, um, to study how kids thrive um, actually in the context of extreme poverty. And one of the um, sub-studies we did was with a group in El Salvador. It was a smaller sample um, of interviews where we asked kids a very long interview. Um, part of it was an identity interview. And 
in our analysis, we really saw that kids use their faith, this is not shocking, to inform how they think about various virtues. And so when a young boy um, was asked about how do you know what is moral, he answered, one is the ways of God, so you always help your neighbors. And then in a particular study on hope, we found that what kids hoped for were very informed by their faith. So you might imagine if you asked a secular group of kids versus a Christian group of kids, you would hope they have hopes that are different. And we did in fact find that 79% of the hopes of the compassion kids were God oriented. I hope to be a missionary and help others so they can know the word of God. 83 had other oriented hopes. I want to be a person who helps those in need. I don't want to be a person who thinks only about myself but rather who thinks about everyone else. And even their individual hopes, like I hope to go to college, was often for a greater purpose. So we saw in these kids that their narrative identity was very other oriented, that their faith deeply impacted that. So what we understand is that one of the magic morsels of this continuum of going from faith to purpose is meaning making and how people make meaning in the world. Because meaning making, the process of making meaning is what actually impacts and informs your narrative identity. And there's some extraordinary work I won't get into um, at USC on like a neuropsychology of meaning making and the role of transcendent emotions simultaneous with abstract reflection enables these are research on adolescents, kids to internalize beliefs as part of their identity. They become meaningful. There's lots of beliefs out there. You guys can scroll Instagram. You have a lot of narrative offerings, thousands, millions of them. What becomes meaningful to you? Is it the one that has the most likes? Do you go, oh, that's important. I'm gonna internalize that into my narrative. How do you make meaning in your life? What becomes meaningful to you? Some great psychology around that. So hopefully, as I've posited, um, that thriving has a lot to do with living out love. And my hope, and religion, and faith, spirituality, I'm using them somewhat synonymously right now, at its best, should be a great source of love. Agreed? Not always, right? And so I want to think with you about the ecology that is available, the resources within religion and spirituality that can be resources for love. So that, that's a tempt of layers of soil. I, I, it looks like a lime slice, um, not an ecological perspective, forgive me. Um, so within our virtues take place in this system. Within religion, there are, I'm going to say, two categories of resources for, for, for virtue development. And I draw heavily on a religious studies professor, Smart is his name, um, and, and, add, and do it a little differently. But this comes, I was writing a chapter that needed to go in um, a, a secular academic handbook. So I needed a way to talk about religions outside of Christianity. So I appealed to religious studies as a framework for thinking about religion. But we have both the category of beliefs and then religion also offers a community of practice, which is marvelous and really different from what you get on Instagram generally. And within beliefs, I identify four categories of beliefs. There's the doctrines. How many of you have taken theology? Yes, so we all have beliefs, the doctrines. I'm gonna use the word narrative a little differently here. Within religions, there's narratives, there's stories. There's narratives about the Presbyterians being the frozen chosen, that we're not an overly charismatic emotional group. Uh, think of Greek mythology. There's lots of narratives that have creation origins, that have a whole ethos, have the vibe, as my daughter loves to say, um, about the faith tradition. Ethics are beliefs that are available that actually say what is right and wrong. Um, and religions also offer a telos of what is the vision of the good life? What is the goal? Is it the reciprocating self? Is that helpful? Is it not? So these are different types of beliefs that religions offer. Communities of practice, 
There are also four different categories that I think are very helpful to identify. There's obviously the social or communal experience of a community's of practice. I don't know about you, but during COVID, my community of practice really changed when life went virtual. The frozen chosen over Zoom is even, like it's like a frozen Zoom screen. It can be really boring. So I had to get really creative with like, with a pod, or who were my people? Who was I gonna practice with and share my vulnerabilities, my prayer requests, um, because I wasn't attending church physically so much. There's also the experiential, and this is one of my favorite areas of research I do. Like, how do people experience transcendence? Like, in my day, we went to camp, roasted marshmallows, hold hands, and sing kumbaya. Uh, now people do psychedelics. Like, how do you all experience transcendence? Is it walking in nature? Your chapel service was beautiful. The music was very elevating. Singing in harmony does a lot for us to experience something beyond ourselves. We at least become mindful of the person singing off tune next to you, which was probably me. We also have rituals and practices within religion. These are phenomenal. They're very formative for people. When communities come together and do communion, the Lord's Supper, or have confirmation, or we have practices of prayer, or Lectio Divina, or scripture reading, or journaling. There's also a material element of communities of practice, which is very fascinating. Now again, as a Protestant, I think we downplay the material. We don't do as much art in my tradition. Um, my kids went to Catholic school, and they learned about the rosary, which I always thought forgive me, was ridiculous. But then when I learned about the rosary and this sensory activation about rubbing these beads, keeping them on cue, repeating a prayer, especially in times of grief or anxiety, I was like, psychologically, that's fantastic to invigorate the senses in our spiritual practices. So how in your own life, in your communities of practice, are you engaged communally, uh, experientially, ritualistically or from a practice perspective and the material. How does that factor into your life? So within the applied aspect of like psychology of religion, practices are very helpful to think about. Those, all those eight categories I just talked about, we all have practices that either engage us in the beliefs category and or the communities of practice category. Um, we read scripture. We meditate on scripture. We pray with and for one another. We sing. We attend church. We wear certain things, crosses or other things. These are all practices that we have that help tie us to these things that help us make meaning, that shape our understanding of what virtues are. So here's a really fancy, like, just like end of the day, hot, tired, like so many arrows. Ward and I were talking about how you don't want too many arrows in a research study. Um, this, so this is accumulation of many moons of work here. But our practices shape those characteristic adaptations, those psychological habits. They also help inform and our evolving sense of narrative identity, which enable us to then live out our purpose. So I'm in, I'll be interested to hear in our discussion time if you find it helpful, practical at all, to think about how these different levels or categories might actually help you pursue your purpose. Do they help you make meaning? I think of one of my Muslim colleagues who covers. She wears hajib. That's, she writes a lot on rights, puberty rights of girls of when they begin to cover and how meaningful it is to them and how helpful it is for the cultivation of their religious identity. As Christians, we don't have quite something so explicit, but I am very aware of what wearing a cross meant 10 years ago in Los Angeles to what it means now is really different. Less people wear crosses. It's more of a statement now than it was 10, 20 years ago. So what does that say about how I think about how I conduct myself? Does how I adorn myself, what I wear, um, the rituals I go through, how does this remind me to be a virtuous person? What reminds me to have hope in the context of a crazy day or a heartbreaking season in life? How does my faith, 
how are these small things, rituals, practices, friends, community, beliefs, I rely on my beliefs a lot that there is something more after this life. I can have joy now despite challenges and obstacles because I know all will be redeemed and I can have that joy and trust in that now. And darn it, psychologically, being able to channel those positive emotions, imagining that which is to come is actually really psychologically beneficial for you today. That's why practices of gratitude have caught on like wildfire, because the positive emotions of gratitude actually motivate us. They help us get through the day. I can remember what traffic light I was at in COVID earlier on when it was getting really hard. And I was like, Bob Emmons, darn it, I need to do some more gratitude practices. I'm getting really heavy hearted. And that's not toxic positivity. I'm not saying be in denial of the challenges of watching my kids as teenagers struggle being at home. My daughter who wouldn't get out of bed, despite the fact that her mom has a PhD and studies thriving. But gratitude helps. And from a faith perspective, it's an invitation because we have a lot to be grateful for, even when things are hard. And these are the things that get me so excited about the integration of psychology and faith. Because there's so much science, actually, that can help us actually get more out of our faith. Not just get more so we feel better or happier or life satisfaction or less depressed or these individual benefits, but no, so that we can be, have fullness of life and be full disciples and fully participate in God's ongoing work in this world. And that's really important. And that's why I do this. That's why I make crazy diagrams. So how can we understand how psychology can actually be helpful? So back to the whole, hopefully, virtuous system, the contextual system that religion and spirituality offer us should be really rich. And when I speak to people in ministry, I ask them, you know, are you taking advantage of, the, of these resources within your tradition? to enable your people to thrive spiritually? Do you, uh, you know, what can you do around the experiential? What can you do with material? Can art be used? Do you, are you very clear about the good life? Dr. Hall was telling me as freshman here, you get to take a class essentially on the good life and get to think about what are different telloi that society, faith, traditions offer us. How does that shape your life? A great book just came out called A Life Worth Living by Miroslav Wolf at Yale and colleagues who writes also on how do you navigate this crazy world today that offers so many narratives? How do you integrate and synthesize one that can enable you to be virtuous, to have hope, to be peaceful, to have faith? So going back to where I was in the beginning, we are in a new landscape. What I was just talking about are like how conventional religious systems have been. If we go back to this idea of a mediating structure, and I'm not gonna limit it to congregations or churches or youth groups, if we think about a university, um, if we think about different organizations, if we think about a platform, what if these systems that we now are a part of that are very transient, there's very little accountability into them, what if they were to mine some of these great resources? Like, what if Instagram had rituals that were formative? What if there was a filter that enabled you to get at more beyond the self or transcendent narratives or moral narratives that were a part of Instagram? And maybe that's what hashtags do. Maybe you can hashtag transcendent narrative identity. I doubt it, but maybe someday. Um, how can we shape systems that people are engaged in so much that might draw on these areas that would be more formative for people. So in this new landscape, with you youngers being prepared, I'm so excited to see what ideas you come up with and what you do in this world. Because I really do think we're changing a lot from older structures to newer systems. 
I'm not proposing that we get rid of churches or that churches or congregations are going anywhere, but people are obviously engaging in other ways. It's amazing how even people are finding community through podcasts. But are they having really communities of practice? Are they gathering? Do they have rituals? Do they offer all that our congregations and religious traditions offer us? So it's really clear not all contexts are created equally. In my work in adolescent or youth development, um, I have a framework that is similar, but you can look at sporting organizations, scouting, political organizations, religious organizations, um, schools. Not all contexts offer fertile grounds like this for thriving in positive youth development. They don't often have that transcendent orientation. They often don't have community and rituals, et cetera. So we're shifting, I think, from meeting structures to systems. Um, and I'm really wondering how we can learn from these older systems and how we might change systems, therapy, how we might change different things that telehealth that we're a part of. And now I want to think with you, I want to try and put this all together into what I would describe as a thriving process that I hope will offer you a way of thinking um, a bit about your own life as we wrap up. So if we think about thriving, we're all born. We got DNA, we got genetics, we're all little seeds. Um, and as we grow, we put down roots. And I want you to consider these roots as your practices. What are the practices, intentional or unintentional, that you have in your life? Um, Jamie Smith's book, You Are What You Love, is a beautiful expose, I think, of how things form us. I have two soccer players, and the practices of going to practice two games on Sunday mornings, these are practices that shape my family's life whether I realize it or not. So what are the rhythms, what are the things, the people you meet with, the habits that you have, social media, communities, prayer, uh, diet, I don't know, different practices that you might have that connect you with those beliefs, those ethics, those doctrines that connect you with people, that connect you with God. Um, what are they in your life? And I'm gonna argue that all those things, those eight categories are not just at church. They're not just at chapel. They're in your classroom. They're in your workspaces. They're in your family. And think of these roots as ways that you are trying to, in a sense, absorb nutrients of love. How do your beliefs about God, your image of God the Father, how might that enable you to feel love from God or maybe hinder, depending about our past? How does your family, is your family a source of love or judgment or both and most likely? Again, how does social media, how does your ethnicity help you gain love, access? I work with the Pennell Center at Fuller which serves black churches. Darn, they do experiential so much better than us frozen chosen Presbyterians. All aspects of our life have strengths for finding love and also deficits. So how do we think about that? And then how do we think about how we get at those eight categories? What are the narratives? What are the purposes you're offered? Is your parent's purpose for you align with your purpose for you? I know for a lot of my students, that's a rub. Cultural expectations are different than some of my students' aspects expectations. Some of my students have very collective senses of purpose, that their purpose is to serve is for their family or for their ethnicity or race. How do we think about those things from the different areas we're in? And then, guess what? You grow a flower of purpose. You grow individually, relationally, and aspirationally, of course, towards the sun. And if things block the sun, plants are quite resilient and grow around to get to the light. And then we grow the leaves of virtue along the way. We cultivate those practices. Through the practices, we cultivate those strengths of, of empathy and perspective taking, of regulation. And I think often one way of thinking about virtue is how they help both regulate us. So patience slows us down and says, whoa, we need to be slower about pursuing that purpose. Hope 
The positive emotions of hope actually activate us. They make us more optimistic about pursuing our purpose. Faith reminds us like, okay, I can. God has invited me to do this, to be a part of his work, and I can do this. And they also direct us. When you're mindful of what you're grateful for, if you keep a gratitude journal, you start to get an idea of your narrative identity, of what matters to you. If you practice joy and consider at the end of the day where you felt alive or felt most joy, over time, like the examine prayer, you will become mindful more of these key components of your identity. So, and then at the end, a plant, a flower goes to seed and contributes back to the soil. And that is part of our cycle, is that pursuing our purpose gives back and provides further nutrients um, to the soil around us. So just a question to muse, like is this a helpful way to think about spiritual formation? We're not always so intentional about developing virtue, it sounds so serious, as, as part of our spirituality, as pursuing purpose. But in many ways for me, it's a very missional perspective of spiritual formation. Um, and so I invite you to consider how you and your faith experience and your practices enable you to pursue purpose, how your life with others, whether formally as in a practicum, um, in your research, um, in a ministry, or your neighbors, how are you helping other people um, thrive and pursue their purpose? So at the end of this, there's been lots of information, graphs, some colors. I, I really hope that you will hear the underlying question of how are you asked to live out love. How do you lean into love in your life? How do you give it to others? And how do you live out love? And where do you think you're headed on that journey? I hope there's been um, some practical pointers on some ways you can pursue that, um, and that that is useful. I'm gonna close by saying I found this, um, actually I found it a few years ago and I completely forgot about this. This is my graduation speech from Glenbrook South High School in 1986. It's a dot matrix. Remember ripping off the sides of the printouts for you olders in this? So in my graduation speech, I actually, I can't believe I said this. I said, we all must come to grips with our own individual definition of success. Now we would say of the good life or of thriving, be it material or spiritual, and strive towards achieving that ideal. Once we have a purpose in life, whatever that may be, our strengths and energy become focused on that one goal and our lives become more worth living. I, I haven't had a new idea in a very long time apparently because I'm still curious about how one does this and that is the work that I've been about the last 20 years. Um, I hope in that you find it helpful um, and perhaps inspiring. I'm gonna cut with our time again if you would like to understand how a lot of this science gets translated into spiritual practices, some are more apt for like secular friends who may not be Christian and some are more explicitly Christian, um, please join our community, sign up for our newsletter. Um, we also have an Instagram. And a new experiment, full experiment Fuller is doing is we have designed some online classes that are asynchronous. And on that, I offer a course on thriving. Um, I call it Thriving, Reframing the Christian Life. Um, and that's available through Fuller Equip. Um, I know small groups have done it and um, churches are using it and grateful for opportunities to integrate psychology into their faith journey. So this is one way that, that I have done that over the years. Um, I hope it's helpful and inspiring and I really can't wait to see the ways you all integrate psychology and faith in your own lives. Um, one of the great joys I have of teaching um, or lecturing or speaking is imagining the people within the audience and the many lives that have been impacted by you all and, and for the youngers that will be impacted by you all. And right now I have a great sense of gratitude for your faculty and the staff, um, those who are mentoring you and shaping you, um, because the work you're about here at Wheaton is so important. And I am so grateful um, that you are participating in God's ongoing work um, and doing that with your specific areas of research. Um, and we'll do that with your studies and ministries in the future. So thank you and bless you on your journey of thriving. Um, we have time for some questions. Yes. Hi. Um, as a minister, what are some of the ways, I know you just talked about your fuller you but, but how are the ways as a minister and someone who has more of that um, theological, pastoral 
Great question. Um, so I, um, they have a lot of answers. Sorry, I'm trying to think of something more quickly. Um, I, you're right. Like the class is actually one way where I've tried to like codify or be systematic about implementing that. But like within my own church or when I consult with churches or I'm talking to churches, I kind of run through, um, maybe not in so much detail as the eight, but think about like, how does your community experience transcendence? Like what is the role of worship in that? Um, it, because I live in Pasadena, there's a lot of fuller faculty in churches and there's a lot of very cerebral approaches to faith, which is awesome. Love that. I love reading theology like nobody's business. But sometimes we need more than just engaging our reason or logic or thinking. So, you know, what is the role of contemplative exercises or ex what is the role of community? Um, and especially right now, I think um, one idea issue I find a lot of traction with is the idea of relationships that both have intimacy and accountability. Um, and I think we're in such a world where we can feel really intimate and disclose things on social me me um, media, but we don't, we're not accountable. So we have this false sense of intimacy. We're not really being known. But at the end of the day, like Compassion International, the work, what I've seen that they do so beautifully is the kids there feel they are known and loved. If a kiddo doesn't show up, there's an adult going out to their house and going, how's your grandmother? She must not have been able to walk you here. And despite how many resources we have in Wheaton or in El Salvador or Rwanda, being known and loved is so important. And churches aren't great at that. People come in and sit in pews and come and go. So how do we enable people, small groups, community, other ways? Any other questions? Yes? I'm curious, back in Australia, like you, with the lowering numbers of um, association with church, I get a lot of people who would say to me, you don't need to be religious to be spiritual. Mm. Um, so two things. I mean, on the one hand, we want all of our friends, whether they're religious or Christians or not, to thrive as human beings and not get mm -hmm. defensive. Mm -hmm. But... I also feel like I'm not giving them the whole, I'm, I'm telling them, giving them peace where there is no real peace. Mm. But, sorry, not a, not a clean question, but how do you manage the, the disconnect between wanting human flourishing mm -hmm. um, that's spiritual but not religious? Great question. And I, I think I hear a few things in there. There's a little bit of like, what's the distinction between religion and spirituality or religiousness and spirituality and how might I parse that? And then this simultaneous question perhaps about thriving in spirituality or religion, or I often am asked, can people thrive without Jesus? Um, and I am going to say God is so much bigger than I am um, and believe that God is working in ways I don't know. I, I think Jesus helps me thrive for sure like the love that we experience as part of the christian gospel and our narrative um, of over and over again of being reminded that we are forgiven that we have grace that we are known um, and good religious or spiritual communities who live that out is our Formative. The issue about religion and spirituality is a uh, one that especially sociologists are really obsessed with. It seems like um, of like religion is decline and people are saying they're spiritual and not religious, um, and that is also echoed in psychology. I am very pretty staunch and do not like to separate them. I think they're overlapping constructs, so that as we are in the adjective would be like. We're like religiousness, we study as psychologists or religiosity and then spirituality. Um, 
for me, I distinguish religi religi religiosity has to do with engaging in one's tradition, one's community, one's beliefs, rituals, and doctrines. Spirituality has more to do with the psychological capacities that enable one to experience transcendence. Um, and, and this has been a bit of a shift in the literature of like, is transcendence only with the sacred, as in capital S, transcendent other God, Allah, or some other kind of holy conceptualization. Um, and increasingly, psychologists are um, considering spirituality that doesn't necessarily have a transcendent or sacred other. And an example I give tongue in cheek, but actually has become more serious, is um, my husband is a sports fanatic, and we live in Pasadena, the home of the Rose Bowl. He has gone to 32 consecutive Rose Bowls, um, which tells you how long we've been married. Um, but for him, I'm always like, oh, that's not transcendent, that's not spiritual. But for him, when the stealth bomber or whatever comes over and there's like the emotional arousal, I mean, the whole stadium, 98,000 people are vibrating, um, and there's the national anthem, and then the football players run out. For him, it is an experience of being like connected in some way with these people. One of the ways in my research that I distinguish like real spirituality is when that transcendence changes the way you see yourself, the world, and the way you act. So having that kumbaya moment or the stealth bomber Rose Bowl moment are moments of arousal and emotional and connection with others. And I'm sure there's phenomenal things going on in the brain. But does that get integrated into your narrative identity? Does that change the way you hope? Does it change your identity? Does it change the way you act? And, and I came on this by, I did a, I'm not saying the study was beautiful. It was a beautiful experience doing it. I was sharing with Ward. I got to study teenagers around the world who were nominated in their culture for living with profound spirituality. I was pregnant with my third child, so my research assistants, one was a graduate from Wheaton, traveled the world to interview these kids in their hometowns. Um, and, and this concept of transcendence emerged, but what really set them apart from like typical kids was their fidelity their devotion and their commitment to these, this, this experience and this worldview that came from it. And what was amazing about these kids is they didn't just have like um, fidelity, like still you were kind of talking about this, like foreclose, like this is it. There was an openness. And they may be like, I don't have it all figured out, but for now this is where I am. And I want more, and I'm practicing, I'm seeking more, and I'm living this out. Um, but there was a humility and openness that came with it. I think when we get that rigid um, commitment, that's often like a sign of foreclosure, and people really haven't explored um, and are believing because they were told to or they weren't given options. Um, so that's some thoughts on that. interested in hearing more about your research around Compassion International. Um, you talked about the idea of thriving with the students. Yeah. And I'm just curious, is thriving a privilege to be able mm. to ask the question of how mm. to thrive? Mm. And I'm wondering, when mm. did your research suggest that it moved from a question of surviving mm -hmm. to thriving? Wow, Cass, great question. Thank you. Or two questions there. So yeah, I... Um, especially you know, in an era with a lot of trauma, a lot of suffering, talking about thriving can feel a little Pollyannic. And so I'm very careful about that. So thriving from my vantage point is actually not a privilege or a luxury. It is like a mandate. Like we need to be able to focus regardless of our situation. And I'm mindful that you know I have food every day in my home um, that, but I have, Early on in life, I started uh, traveling globally, um, like at 16, and um, I was so struck by how people in developing nations had more what I would call joy than like my teenage friends back in my high school. And I was like, that church just gave me a pigeon and they don't have many more and they're not gonna be able to eat in weeks, but their generosity and it came from such a genuine place. And that, I think, got me at an early age really asking questions about what is true joy, what is true thriving. Thriving is not contingent on material wealth, but 
we do some, we have human needs that are material, like for food and sleep. Um, we, our nervous systems need to feel safe. We cannot be like this all the time, which you are, by the way, between now and finals, which are coming up. So just give yourself a break and you're full throttle, but then you're gonna need time to calm your nervous systems down. And so when we're in survival mode, what I often talk about is like survival mode is literally from an evolutionary perspective is when you're focused on yourself. Like I'm gonna get the meat, the animal, or you're in group. So a surviving orientation is me oriented and a thriving orientation is we oriented. A surviving orientation is just trying to cope. And, and we need to do that. Like in COVID, we had to cope. We had to make sense. We had to make new um, patterns and make meaning of all we were going through. But thriving really has hope. There's hope for something more. So these are, and I'm, I'm forgetting my other rhymes, sorry. <laughs> but the, the difference between thriving and surviving. But we all go through cycles and we go through striving cycles, right? Like finals is kind of that, like, mm, you're gonna strive and really focus and work really hard and maybe live a little out of balance because doing well in your finals is gonna enable you to pursue your purpose. But you can't have that posture too long because we need to also be present to thrive. So you can kind of get by with a full throttle posture for a bit, but to thrive, you need patterns of rest. There's rhythms that you need for that. So, so thank you for asking that. But we did, we have found, it's amazing. And um, so we've been in Rwanda, Uganda, in El Salvador, that um, some of the elements of what we would call positive youth development around connections and character and competencies, these things exist across cultures. Um, some of them are harder to measure with the same measurement tools, like behaviors look really differently um, in different cultures. Like, Compassion International kids are not signing up for volunteer service, right? Because their, their volunteering is bringing water a mile for their family. So that's kind of something Americans do that are more well off. But they can lead and they can serve and they can help. And so in different contexts, people might live out contribution a little bit differently. And we're finding in like the global development work, um, like the um, United Nations SDGs, um, they have one that's around soft skills, but it's a really strong deficit orientation. Um, so we're, this work is actually global and we're part of some global consortiums of trying to help people internationally think about things like purpose. Um, and that might sound like a luxury, but even when you don't have a lot of resources, even being purposeful, because it, it's, it's sanctified by my faith or it's for the benefit of my family. It brings a lot of motivation to people's schooling, showing up for their vaccinations, et cetera. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for your time. That was a dearth of um, information. And um, again, I'm really grateful to be here and, and blessings on your journey of your own thriving. And, and I always say like, we, you don't thrive until you help someone else thrive. So um, blessings in your journey on that. Thank you. <laughs>